I'm going to talk on anti-doping in sport, and I was a late call-up, as I said to, to the list for today. Um, I got involved with doping in sport because I worked with, with Glaxo, producing a range of sports nutrition supplements that were free of banned substances, and also have, for the last nine years, up until, well, up until last year, been on the board of UK Anti-Doping, which is the National Drug Testing Agency in the UK. And I've got a whistle-stop tour of quite a few slides that I'm just going to flick through. Um, this slide, anybody know what this is? This is the 100-metre uh, final at the Seoul Olympics in 1988. Uh, and you'll see the guy with his arm up, that's Ben Johnson. Uh, of the eight competitors in that race, believe it or not, seven of them uh, subsequently tested positive for banned substances. It was the race that changed the history of doping in the world, really. And it got governments, it got sports, all saying that this cannot continue. Ben Johnson tested positive, our own Linford Christie uh, subsequently tested positively, as did Carl Lewis, uh, who actually finished uh, second in the race but was subsequently found to have failed four drugs tests as an American athlete. Um, partly as a result of that race and the clamour that there was to really try and clean sport up, uh, WADA, or the World Anti-Doping Agency, was established uh, really to provide the overarching policing for anti-doping in the world. And WADA do that through what's called the WADA Code. Uh, the code is effectively the rule book that they uh, set out. It's updated every year. It provides a regular series of a commentary of, of, of ideas and of thought, but particularly it identifies the banned list, uh, which is the list of substances and procedures that athletes uh, are not allowed to take, or indeed their supporters, their entourage are not allowed to take, uh, because if they do, they will be guilty of an anti-doping rule violation, or ADRV. Uh, there are three uh, possibilities as, as to why a substance can appear on the banned list. One is that it is uh, likely to enhance sports performance. The second, as you'll see, is that it's damaging to health. And the third is, is that it violates the spirit of sport. If a substance is seen to violate or to be in breach of two of those conditions, then it becomes something that can go on the banned list. And therefore, if an athlete is found to have that substance or has undertaken that procedure, so the procedure is probably uh, something where there's been an operation or an infusion or indeed something like blood doping that has occurred that is illegal, then they would be banned for that as well. Um, to try and give you a picture for the overall scene in, in the world, WADA, as I say, are the overarching policing body, and each country has signed up to a UNESCO agreement that uh, b binds it effectively to uh, setting up its own national anti-doping organisation, or NADO. And it's those NADOs that work within each country uh, to police, to set the rules, and to test and to educate. And when testing, uh, unfortunately, as we all know, happens to catch athletes who have committed anti-doping rule violations. In this country, the NADO is UK Anti-Doping, or UCAD, uh, with the overall remit of protecting sport through education and, of course, through the policing and the testing. That's a little bit of the background. I'm going to go very quickly now onto the challenges because... Uh, that race was in Seoul in, in 1988. Times have moved on, but one could argue that things in sport haven't always moved on. We've seen very well documented uh, issues in sports such as cycling, uh, where there was the notorious incident with a jiffy bag, there have been notorious incidents of individuals such as uh, Lance Armstrong, all of whom have been seen uh, to have violated the spirit of sport and to have um, taken substances that will in artificially enhanced sport performance. Uh, we've seen as well, not just sports, but countries where there has been a clear violation of the WADA code. And this occurs when a NADO, a national anti-doping organization, basically decides that they are not going to comply with the WADA code. They will close ranks within the, the borders of that country and allow their athletes, and indeed encourage their athletes, to take banned substances. That's something that can cause huge issues because ultimately, if you have some countries where athletes are allowed to get away with taking banned substances, whereas other countries, such as the UK, the USA, Australia, where they've got very well entrenched NADOs, uh, you will have an unlevel playing field. And I know, having spoken with many athletes, that it's that imbalance between what some countries apply and other countries don't apply that causes all sorts of issues. Other issues are lifetime bans. Um, should an athlete be banned 
for life if they consume a banned substance. Uh, there's a strong argument amongst many athletes to say yes. And if you talk to an athlete who's finished fourth in, Oli in an Olympic Games, missed out on a medal, but subsequently other athletes who finished above them have tested positively, then of course they are going to say very strongly that those athletes should be banned for life to enable them to get what they have achieved. On the other hand, if you have a young athlete uh, who is cajoled by a coach or indeed even a parent into taking a banned substance at an early age, should they then suffer for the rest of their career? We then have what's called TUEs, or Therapeutic Usage Exemption Forms. These are, for me, the, one of the real um, problem areas in doping. These allow athletes who've got proven medical conditions to take certain substances, and they enable athletes, in a sense, to move into a grey area, which is that gap between what's allowable and what isn't allowable. If I had my way, I would ban TUEs. They uh, are rife, they are open to abuse. I could go into our lab uh, at St Mary's, our sports science lab. I am not asthmatic. I could undertake an exercise-induced asthma test and fail it because I know how to do it, as do many other athletes. I would be prescribed a steroid, and that steroid would give me an illegal advantage when it comes to my oxygen uptake capacity. So I, frankly, would ban TUEs. There are also a particular challenge for Paralympic athletes uh, where medication is clearly required in order to help them with many of the conditions that they have to, com to compete. There's a thing called whereabouts that is also a real challenge. It's where every athlete has to say where he or she is going to be for one hour every day of the year, uh, three, well, 365 days of the year. That's to enable the doping control officers to knock on the door, ring the bell, and know that they are going to be in. Uh, it's a real problem. Uh, three misses from whereabouts and you are banned. Uh, there is no viable alternative because if you don't have whereabouts and they knock on the door and they disappear out the back door and say, I wasn't in, then it's, it's, it opens the door up literally to those athletes taking banned substances and getting away with it. We also have another challenge, which is strict liability. That means that every athlete is responsible for what he or she has inside their body. Many athletes will say, oh, this is awful. I've tested positive for nandrolone, but it was in that piece of steak that I ate, or in the case of um, other, other individuals, it'll be something that I was told to have. Completely not able to do that. Strict liability means that if something is found within you, you are responsible for that. And unless there is a really extreme case, it's unlikely that your ban will be reduced. But there are opportunities, really positive. I think we have opportunities to educate. Phil has already spoken about uh, the work he has done in educating our students, and particularly the strength and conditioning students, the next generation of sports scientists, strength and conditioning coaches who know how to prepare athletes cleanly without the use of banned substances. I think we have a real opportunity here at St Mary's and more broadly to do that. We also need to make taking doping, taking drugs in sport, in a sense similar to how we treat um, drink driving, something that we don't want to happen, and we have hotlines now that will encourage athletes to effectively report those who have taken banned substances. Science has moved on. We can now take an athlete passport. We can take physiological measurements of sports people and work out that if those measurements change very rapidly, it's likely to be as a consequence for taking a banned substance. Um, nutritional supplementation is also a real issue. Making sure that athletes take products that are clean is absolutely critical. And there is a, not a government-backed, but a nationally supported um, program in uh, Newmarket near Cambridgeshire, which tests all of the supplements, the batches of supplements, and badges them clean for individuals to take. Sorry, there was a slide out there, I think. Um, why should we bother? We need to bother because it impacts on young people. The young people are the next generation of sports people because if we allow doping to continue, it will percolate down through uh, the process and everybody will need to take them. We want our athletes to be clean, to be great, and to do so without taking banned substances.